I keep trying to do those things like, you know, read through the Bible in a year, that sort of thing. Except I start reading and I get completely consumed by whatever I'm reading right then. And I end up doing a Bible study on it. It takes all my Bible time. So, so I, I never get through the Bible in a year. I get through chapters in a year. But, um, but nonetheless, it's, it's great to study the Word. And so this week I was reading and I happened upon Psalm 51. How, how many of you know what Psalm 51 is? Okay. Well, Psalm 51 is actually a prayer of contrition. Contritio is the Latin term from which the word contrition is derived. And what it meant in Latin, or still means, I guess, is um, crushing. You're crushing something when you contritio. That word kind of moved from Italy around the globe, moved through France, and ended up in England as contrition. And in medieval times in England, contrition was to crush something to powder. Just, you know, take a rock or something and just beat it down to nothing where it's just turned into powder. So it's, it's the absolute, complete destruction of something into its smallest form, being compressed, as it were. The term in Christianity, however, kind of parallels that, but it's a little different in that it's what it is. This is my own definition, so if you don't like it, well, uh, take it up with him. Yeah, there you go. Um, (laughs) um, An earnest feeling of regret for one's sins or iniquities. It is the product of the Holy Spirit's conviction. How many of you know that we don't get guilty, we don't have a sense of guilt or conviction just on our own. Anybody know that? Show of hands. Okay, some of you know that. The Word of God says in John 16, 8, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He said, And he, when he comes, that is the Holy Spirit, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. You see, we don't even come at a conviction of our sins and failures without God's help. There's another place where Jesus says, John 15, that I am, I am divine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The next time you're feeling like pretty big and powerful, next time you're thinking, yeah, I'm all that, remember what Jesus said. You can't do anything apart from him. And the tragedy of that is, when we try, what ends up happening is we do something but it's certainly not honoring God, and it creates sorrow in our life and oftentimes in the lives of many others. That's the nature of fallen man, and that is the product of fallen man, sin and iniquity. And sin is just like missing the mark. It's an archer's term in medieval times. It means missing the mark. You aimed at a target, and you missed. Well, when we don't do God's will, we are missing the target. So, anyway, so I'm thinking about contrition, and I'm reading uh, Psalm 51, where King David is being very contrite, much later than he should have, but at least he finally got there. And um, that's a good thing. How many of us, maybe in our lives, have carried around sin for a really long time before we finally said, you know, I'm guilty, Lord forgive me, and received Forgiveness and the removal of that burden, that weight of guilt and condemnation. Thank you, Lord. But I want to look at two different stories today, and I'm going to do it quickly, so we're not going to get the whole story, but just a few points. The first king of Israel was King Saul. He was appointed king because God gave the people what they wanted. They wanted a big, tall, good-looking guy who would exercise authority over the realm, and bring order out of the chaos of individual liberty. They all were, up until that point, doing what was right in their own eyes before God and man. But they got tired of that, and they wanted somebody who would bring them, you know, stability and security and all these things that people talk about. They talk about them today. And, you know, 
people just love a strong man if, until, of course, he gets too strong, and then he starts telling them what to do, and then they don't like him at all. But uh, that's just the nature of humankind. So, so, God says to Samuel the prophet, he says, okay, here's the guy, Saul. Go and anoint him. And he did, and the people praise God we have a king just like all the other countries around us. We're tired of looking like losers because we don't have a king like they do. And um, so, so Saul becomes the king. A great looking guy, very regal looking, you know, and so they're all feeling good about that. But in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 8 through 14, we read something about the character of Saul. Now he waited for seven days until the appointed time that Samuel had set. Samuel said, I'm going to join you seven days from now, and we will offer offerings to the Lord for, for the sin of the nation and for ourselves. And that was the way to expunge the sin from your life was to offer these sacrifices. So Saul waited for seven days until the appointed time that Samuel had set. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. His army was leaving because nothing was going on. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. But as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. But Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, since I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come at the appointed time, in other words, it's Samuel's fault, right? Um, and that the Philistines were assembling at Mishmash, and they were. There was a huge army of their opponents, the Philistines, that was assembling against the, the people of Israel. I thought the pressure was on. And Saul says, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not asked the favor of the Lord. So I worked up the courage and offered the burnt offering. But Samuel said to Saul, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For the Lord would now have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. You see, Saul disobeyed God at a fundamental level. He disobeyed the direct orders of God through the prophet Samuel. The great prophet of God, Samuel, denounced Saul's kingship due to his disobedience and further his excuses for that disobedience. You hear all the things he was saying about, you know, I could, what could I do? You know, you weren't here, you were late, and the enemy was arrayed against me, and my people were beginning to leave, and I got to keep the army together to fight the enemy, and, and it was all a bunch of excuses. Straight up, he did not obey the command of the Lord. But somehow, that wasn't his fault. That was everybody else's fault. In 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23, Samuel takes it even further. And he says, Does the Lord have as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? What is the answer to that question? No, exactly. Thank you. God is far less concerned about the sacrifices that we make for him than in us simply obeying what he said to do. I know a lot of people that think they're going to do something for God, and that's going to make them okay. Or because they did good works in this world, God's going to receive them into heaven. Unfortunately, that's their idea of what God should do. God never said that. What God said was, obey me. Do my commandments. And if you do that, you're okay. And if you don't do that, you're not. Anybody ever broken the commandments of God? Yeah, I think a few of us have. Matter of fact, the word says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us has broken the commandments of God at some point in our life. We did so unknowingly or we did so knowingly. Or, as in my case, happily jumping in with both feet and did both 
unknowing and knowing sins. So God, because he knows what he made in me and in you, figured out that we were a problem and we were going to have problems. And that's why he sent his son Jesus, was in fact to deliver us from our own inability to keep those commandments. But I digress. Samuel went on and he said, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as reprehensible as the sin of divination or witchcraft. And insubordination is as reprehensible as false religion and idolatry. Since you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Whoa. You know, it's interesting to me about this. Samuel says this directly in Saul's face. And Saul may have been king, but he wasn't messing with Samuel because Samuel was known by all of the people as the ordained, anointed prophet of God. He was the one that said Saul would be king because God said so. And now he's saying Saul will not be king because God said so. And there was no getting around that, right? But when you and I mess up, when we do things wrong, do we just leave it there? Well, I messed up. I guess I'm done. I'm, I'm no hope now. No. We can be contrite of heart. We can repent of that sin. We can say, oh God, forgive me. I messed up again. Lord Jesus, wash these sins from me. Remove them from me as far as the east is from the west. And the thing is, that's exactly what happens. God will forgive us our sins, look upon them no more. But Saul's response wasn't, oh God, forgive me, have mercy upon me. This is, this is what he said, and it's further on in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have violated the command of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and listened to their voice. But get this, that sounds pretty good. He's acknowledging his sin, right? You know, I sinned. I screwed up, Samuel. But does he then ask for forgiveness and mercy? No, this is what he says. Now then, please pardon my sin to Samuel, not to God, and return with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Then Samuel turned to go. But Saul grasped the edge of his robe, and it tore off. So Samuel said to him, this man was desperate. The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor, who is better than you. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie nor change his mind. What is the glory of Israel? The Holy Spirit. Um, when Saul was anointed king, the Holy Spirit came upon him. Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was not residing inside people because their spirits were still dead in sin. Jesus had not yet paid the price for their sin. But prophets, leaders, priests, often the Lord would anoint them with the Holy Spirit. And that's why Elijah could do the amazing things he did. That's why Elisha could raise the dead. It's things like that, that God's power working in them would, would do in the world around them. But the average person, you or me, would not have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. We just lived our lives. That glory of God that had been upon Saul has been lifted away. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie nor change his mind, for he is not a man that he would change his mind. When God makes a decision, buddy, it's done. Then Saul said, get this, he still doesn't get it. He says, I have sinned, but please honor me now before the elders of my people and before all Israel and go back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. You see, he's just worried about everybody else knowing what has happened. He didn't want them to know that God had lifted his glory from Saul. 
What do you think? I think the chances are pretty good that people figured out relatively quickly that the glory of God was no longer upon Saul. You know, um, we can't do it on our own. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. And now Saul was left with exactly nothing. So Samuel did go back following Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. He did one thing right. He worshipped the Lord. Praise God for that. And if you ask me, do I think Saul's in heaven now? I would say, I believe that he is, you know. He just missed the opportunity to be the godly king he could have been for his people. He missed the opportunity of having his lineage go forward and be king upon king upon king through gen multiple generations. That was all taken from him because of his disobedience. Now, let's contrast that story to another king. In fact, the next king, King David. King David... God referred to him as a man after my own heart. That's pretty heavy, you know. A man after his own heart. A man like him, with a personality or a, or a temperament like God's own. Wow, that's pretty good. I don't think God's ever said that to me. I've asked him, what do you think of me before? And he one time said, he said, you are the joy of my desiring. And one other time, when I was encouraged by somebody else to ask him what he thought of me, he said, you're the apple of my eye. Those were nice things, but he never said, you know, you're Tom, you're a man after my own heart. Now, that would be cool, wouldn't it, Jim? So, um, <laughs> well, anyway, David had that, had that said of him by God. But after he'd been king for a while, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we see, starting in verse 1, that it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle. And let me just make a note about that. Do you realize that right now there's a lot of turmoil going on about what we did or did not do in Afghanistan over the last 20 years, and more particularly what we've done in the last six weeks? And, you know, one of the knocks against our, our current administration is that they didn't understand that in Afghanistan, like other medieval and earlier societies, when the winter snows break and spring comes, that's when everybody starts fighting again. During the winter, they don't do that. That's right now, today. That's the thinking. And that's what was going on 3,500 years ago when David was king. It says, then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab that was the chief of his armies, and his servants with him in all Israel. And they brought destruction on the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, which was the capital city of Ammon. But David stayed in Jerusalem. What? The king is not leading his troops? That's what these kings did. But David has been fighting for, at this point, probably 25 years. And he's like, you know, I've been fighting a long time. I have personally killed hundreds of the enemy myself. Sometimes, completely alone, I've killed hundreds of the enemy. I, I'm, I'm king now. It's time to chill. And so he's staying in Jerusalem. He's got a really nice pad. And, and he's like just cruising, you know, chilling out. Meanwhile, his army is besieging this city of Ammon, this great walled city. They're the ones who are doing this assault in the king's name, but without the king. That's a rare thing. And as a result of that, now at evening time, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he's looking, he's up on the mountain there at the center of Jerusalem with his palace. And down below him, he can see, you know, down to the other houses below. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent servants and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? 
Then David sent messengers and had her brought. And when she came to him, he slept with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. Now I would note to you that David's sin, because that's what this is. This is a sin of adultery right now. He's taking another man's wife as his own. The sin has four parts to it. First, he looked perhaps innocently. I mean, he's just walking around on the roof of his, of his uh, palace there. Happens to look down and, whoa, look at that. Right then, he could have, what, averted his eyes and said, whoa, that's, you know, stay away. You know? I have a dear friend in the Lord, Mike Shreve, is an evangelist. And um, one time he was talking about how at the time he was not married. He was a single guy. He was out traveling the country, you know, p- preaching in tent revivals and stuff. And very cool, kind of strange ministry. And, um, and he was asked by somebody, well, you're in Fort Lauderdale. You're going to go to the beach? He says, I never drive by the beach when I'm down here <laughs> because too many bikinis. He just learned to avoid the temptation rather than having to repent of the temptation. But David, maybe it was genuinely innocent that he glanced down and saw Bathsheba. But that was point one. Number two, he kept looking. Not so innocent now, is it? Now he's, he's looking. Number three, he pursued her, inquired about her, and pursued her. And four, finally, he yielded to the devil's temptation and his own lust. As a result, God's man and the leader of God's people fell into sin. And from that sin arose another sin, murder. One of his own warriors, Uriah the Hittite, which means he was a foreigner, but he worshipped the God of Israel. Um, was there at Ammon besieging the city. And David is back in Jerusalem where he should not have been and is sleeping with Uriah's wife. David was king. As Mel Brooks said, it's good to be the king. He could have any woman that he wanted. But one thing he could not do, according to God's law, was have another man's wife. So, I suppose everything would have been hunky-dory, but for one thing. Bathsheba then sends word to the king and says, hey, I'm pregnant. Well, Uriah hasn't been anywhere on the scene for a while now because he's off in Ammon. So, whose baby could this be? One option, David's. So, David tries to trick Uriah into coming home and sleeping with his wife so that then, you know, oh, well, it's Uriah's kid. But Uriah refuses. He says, no, while, while the men are in the field arrayed against the enemy, I will not come back and enjoy fellowship with my, with my wife. And he didn't. So David is like, rats, you know, that's not working. But he's got to cover this up. Because you know what, this, you know what the law of God says about adultery? You know what the punishment for that is? It's death. David, A, did not want to die. David, B, did not want the people to know that he had committed such a sin. Wouldn't their respect for him drop? Well, of course. You know, we see it in our age. Leaders who are randy fools, and we end up making fun of them, and they're a little diminished in our eyes. We might like some political policy of theirs or something, but we don't really think they're good men. In fact, we know they're not. Because not only have they done these things, they have not repented of it. They have not turned to God. And as a result, they are still guilty of the sins they have committed. Well, so David, finally, to protect his own reputation before the people, has Uriah killed. He has him sent to the front lines, attacking this great walled city of Ammon, and tells Joab, his general, Look, when Uriah's up at the front, they're attacking the walls. Then pull everybody back 
So poor Uriah is standing there fighting against the Ammonites by himself. And of course, he's killed. It's straight up murder. It's just murder by a different means. Today, we have a different way of dealing with things like that. When the woman says, I am pregnant, well, we don't kill her husband. You know, that would be difficult and might arouse suspicions and get us in trouble, as it did for David. Instead, we just kill the baby. That way, we don't have to deal with it anymore, you know. And uh, she goes away for a couple of days to visit her aunt and comes back, and there's no baby anymore. And that's how we deal with things like that. Guess what? It's still murder. Matter of fact, it may be worse because we are committing murder against an innocent whom, who should have been protected. Well, so David is, has really done something foul. I mean, this is terrible. This isn't sort of bad. This is like really bad, right? He's betrayed the trust of his own troops, has laid with the wife of another, and now has seen to it that that man is killed to keep and preserve his own uh, position before the people. You might say, well, too bad for David. He's done. He's toast. And this went on for about a year that David lived with this lie. Bathsheba knew it too. She didn't say anything. So I don't know that she was setting out to have an affair with King David, but once in for a penny, she was in for a pound. And she uh, kept the secret, and she eventually, after Uriah's death and after she had spent time in mourning, married King David. And the prophet Nathan shows up, and he tells David a story. And I'm not going to go into all that, but he tells David a story about a poor man who had one little ewe lamb that was his only possession, and he loved that ewe lamb. It slept in the bed with him. They were so close, and with his children and him. And, and a rich man was having a banquet and had visitors coming from afar, and he said, I don't want to, you know, take from my flocks. So he... So he grabbed the poor man's ewe, slaughtered it, and served it to its guests. And David, hearing this from Nathan, his blood was boiling. And he said, who is the man? I will see to it that he is punished. Nathan, this is what I love about prophets, you know. They don't mess around, you know. Nathan is standing before the king of all Israel, a man who could, with a word, have him slaughtered himself. And when David says, who is the man? He says, you are the man. And in that moment, in that moment, David knew he was exposed. And this is how David responded to the accusation, the conviction that now came upon him from the Holy Spirit-empowered prophet. He says in 2 Samuel 12, 13, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has allowed your sin to pass. You shall not die. And you might say, well, that doesn't seem so bad. God's letting him get a pass. But in fact, if you read that whole chapter... God says, from this time on, you're going to suffer violence in your own household. Your own wives and concubines will be ravaged by another. You will struggle to the end of your days. And, you know, all the terrible things that are enumerated there will come to pass. And they did. We read the rest of the history of David's reign, and a whole bunch of really bad things happened, including civil war there in the nation. But notice the difference here. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He knew it was true. Do you see any effort here to make an excuse? To try to explain why it happened and why it really wasn't his fault? No, not at all. He just stated the blunt fact. I have sinned against the Lord.
There, right there, is the difference between Saul and David. Saul, hey, it, didn't, it wasn't my fault. Come on, please, forgive me. I didn't mean to do it. It was just a mistake. You know, it was a bad day. I was, you know, had a flat tire in the car. There were all kinds of pressures going on, and the bills were late, and I hadn't gotten paid yet, and, you know, all these things are going on. What was I supposed to do? David, on the other hand, said, you're right. I did it. Oh, God, forgive me. Another thing about David that's pretty cool, because I happen to be a songwriter, and one of the things I really like is songwriters, and David was actually a great songwriter. He wrote a whole bunch of psalms. That book of psalms in the Bible, most of that was written by David. He was a, a, a great musician, apparently, a very skilled musician on the lyre at that time, the stringed instrument, and... Um, and he wrote a lot of psalms. And one of them that he wrote is Psalm 51. And that psalm was written about this situation. After he had come face to face with his sin and repented of it, he wrote that psalm as an act of contrition. He had been crushed by his own sin and iniquity. And now he sought God's forgiveness. And I'm very quickly going to read through that psalm. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your faithfulness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Wipe out my wrongdoings. Wash me thoroughly from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my wrongdoings and my sin is constantly before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned. You might say, well, he sinned against Uriah, kind of sinned against Bathsheba, you know. But he correctly understood that the sins that we commit in this world are fundamentally sins against our God because we have disobeyed his commandments on how we are to live. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done which, what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. I've got no defense, Lord. Here I am. I did it. Behold, I was brought forth in guilt, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in secret you will make wisdom known to me. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. That's the tree branches they used as a brush to clean off the altar in the, in the temple. That would have been tough. He's saying, purify me, just whatever it takes, you know, because that would have been painful to be, you know, <laughs> cleaned off with hyssop. Um, but, and I will be clean. Cleanse me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and wipe out all my guilty deeds. Create in me a clean heart, God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach wrongdoers your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips so that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. God, you will not despise. Let me read that again. That's verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices and burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. David knew what to do. He had done the wrong thing. He acknowledged it. He repented of it, and he pleaded with God to change the circumstances, as only God could. To lift the blood guiltiness off of him, to maintain his fellowship with God through the Holy Spirit, 
and the authority that he'd been given before the people as the king of, of the kingdom. And because he turned from his wickedness, because he humbly repented before God for his failures, God heard and forgave. And not only did David live out a long life as king, but his heirs continued. The lineage of David goes right to the king of kings, Jesus Christ. He is from the generations of David. I mean, you don't get better than that. The only begotten son of God is of the lineage of David. Amazing. God is faithful. Faithful and just to forgive, the word declares. So maybe you're here today, and there have been some things that have been hanging around on your heart or in your mind. Maybe there's been some times where um, you didn't do right. And the devil comes along and beats you up all the time over that. Because every time you start feeling good, he reminds you again. Remember when you did that? That thing? Remember when you broke your mother's heart? Remember the time you betrayed your father's trust? Remember the time you let your little daughter down? Remember the time that you uh, treated people at work like, like jerks and stole from them? Whatever it may be. Everybody's got those secrets. Everybody's got those things that they did that they're not proud of. The things they do not want to have exposed to the light. Well, here's the good news. You actually, in most situations, never have to expose any of that stuff to the light of the world. But if you don't give it to God, if you don't lay these burdens down and ask him for forgiveness, if you don't repent of the sin, but try to continue to justify yourself, to explain away why it's really not your fault, you know, it was just a mistake. You didn't mean to do it. Well, you have about as much forgiveness granted to you under those circumstances as King Saul did, which is to say, none at all. But, on the other hand, if you, like David, humble yourself before God and say, oh, God, forgive me. I have screwed up. I messed up royally here. I ask your forgiveness, Lord God. Please take this sin and condemnation from me. I don't want to be victimized by it any longer. I don't want to suffer under the lies of Satan who keeps using this like a goad to just hurt me. Lord God, forgive me and take this from me. And when you ask him to forgive you, guess what? He will. Now, the one thing that distinguishes us from Saul and David is that we live after the cross, not before. Jesus already suffered and died on your behalf and on my behalf, and he's already washed all the sins in this world with his blood. The problem is, because people are ignorant, vain, and foolish— I'm not asking for a show of hands here who wants to claim that. But um, because people are that way, they don't know that they need to accept the free gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. Instead, they carry on, weighed down with sin. So if you're here today and you've been struggling with sin, I want to encourage you as the band comes and they're going to uh, sing a song. I want to encourage you to just give it up. It's not that hard. And the price is like nothing. You just ask Jesus to save you of your sins, to forgive you for those things that you've done wrong, to become your Savior and Lord. And he will do so if you mean it. And are not just saying words. If you mean it, God is going to minister to you. Now, while the band is playing, I'm going to encourage the people here to just be in prayer. We're going to take some time today, and we're just going to pray after the song and after the altar call. And I would ask you even now to be in prayer for those who are here that need to give it up, need to repent of their sins, need to receive Jesus as their Savior. Pray for their souls. Ask the Lord to bring conviction, the Holy Spirit's conviction upon them that they would surrender all to Jesus Christ. Oh, it's a good thing. It's the best thing. Let's pray. 
precious, Lord. I thank you for your people. I thank you for the word that's gone forth. And I pray, Father God, that you would use this word, that it would burn in the hearts of your people, and that they would know not to be a Saul, but to be a David, to straight up confess their sins and receive the forgiveness that you bring. Oh, Lord God, you are so gracious and loving, so merciful and kind. We don't deserve any of it. We deserve death, to be blotted out, like contritio actually means in Latin. But Father God, in your mercy, you've made a way for us. I pray, Lord God, that today, each and every person within the sound of my voice, here in this sanctuary and those online, would receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, would repent and receive the blessings of Almighty God in their life, that they would no longer be weighed down by this burden of guilt and sin. Oh, Father, move in the hearts of your people this day. Call those who are to be your people in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord.